everybody and welcome to our early comics review video. I'm Andy. I'm Matt. We're here with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this is our really big show where we show you some of the biggest and best books that are coming out this week so you don't miss out on any of the good stuff. Whether you shop locally with us at the Infinity Flux store or with us online at infinityflux.net, we just want you to have a better idea about what books you can expect to see in your stores this week and have a little extra knowledge about yeah. them as well. So we've got some big ones this week. You can see them right, lined up right here. What are your first two big ones? Well, I'm going to start with Reptilicus, number one. This one is one that I have been waiting for for a long time. We talked about this a while back. Oh, yeah. Uh, this one's got, uh, you know, everything that you could want. Giant lizards. And the price on it, 10 cents. 10 cents. Uh, this is going to be amazing. 100. I know, because they're going to be, you know, I, I, I am expecting big, big things for Reptilicus. But to go along with that, I also have Space War, Ooh. which is about another giant uh, lizard. And there is a rumor that these two are going to meet up in the shared Reptilicus universe. Yeah, but, Space War X Reptilicus. Yeah, but, yeah. We'll, but right, but we'll have to wait and see. But uh, I highly recommend both of these books. Uh, they're both um, great jumping on points oh, yeah, after it. the last big crossovers that they've been telling. All that's done now. You can finally jump onto both of these. And, you know, I can't wait to see who the next uh, or what the next story arc is for both of these properties. Yeah, and I've got uh, things like we got our next issue of Morbius. Issue number three looks like we're getting a guest appearance by Spider-Man. Yeah. You know, we've all been waiting for that. Yep. Very excited. You know, uh, we talked about maybe a movie potential for Morbius. We'll have to wait and see. That, billion dollars right there. Easily. In, guaranteed. Yeah. In guaranteed. Yeah. And we also have this really cool, this actually comes polybagged. I wonder why. Something, something spicy in it or something. But this is Archie's <laughs> Super Teens. Uh, for all of you big Archie Cinematic Universe fans, yeah. you've got all the superheroes coming together in one big book, polybagged for your protection, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? The the super teens I'm really excited about because it was just Archie teens, mm. but now with the new creative team, they decided to go in the new direction and do the it's super bold. teens. It's instead. bold, but it's we'll a little see different, how it works but uh, out. yeah. April Fools! Yeah, <laughs> whoa! We totally had you fooled, right? Not you. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyways, yeah. we've got some really good books yeah, we for do. this week. So, of course, we are kicking this off. We've got some of the big ones from Jeff John's new imprint, Ghost Machine. I keep wanting to say Mad Ghost. That's something else. That's something yeah, else. I think. Ghost Machine. So, uh, kick it off with what was one of my favorite books of this week as well. Yeah, this is my absolute favorite book of the ones that I've read so far, and I'm sure the ones that I still have left to read. Rook Exodus, number one. This book is amazing. I loved it so much. So, this is written by Jeff Johns. Uh, the art is by Jason Fabok. Now, it is part of the Ghost Machine imprint. It is not part of the unnamed universe yeah. like Redcoat and Geiger are. This is its own thing, even though it's part of the same imprint. But this, uh, if and if you've read, if you read the Rook story in the uh, Ghost Machine one shot that came out about a month or two ago, then you're already familiar with this story. But just in case you aren't, this is this starts as your typical story of Earth being depleted of all its resources and humanity goes off to find another planet, and they do. They find the planet Exodus, and uh, they use a big world engine to terraform that planet, which is great. And that, that world engine uh, controls the weather, the environment, the wildlife, all that stuff. But after about 10 years or so, that world engine stops working, mm -hmm. and resources start to run out. Um, and everybody who can leave the planet does leave the planet, and the only people left behind are the workers and the farmers. They kind of build this like, yes, you have to work there, yeah. but you get to experience just all the greatness stuff yeah. that these people who could pay to be there could. Right. And the company, uh, their name is Better World. Uh, the company who did terraform the planet, they told these guys, we will come back for you, mm -hmm. and they didn't. So uh, none of that actually happens in the book. That's that's just the backstory to this book. Maybe we'll see that in a flashback one day. But by the time this book starts, all of that has already happened. This takes place two years after the mass evacuation of the planet, which happened one year after the world machine stopped working. And um, so now we are left with this planet called Exodus, which, again, the resources are running out. The water is drying up. The food is running out, that kind of thing. 
And we follow this guy right here. His name is Rook. He is a warden. And the wardens are a group of people who use these helmets to kind of sort of control various wildlife. So yeah. his helmet can control birds and crows and rooks and things like that. There's another warden named Swine who wears a big like boar looking helmet. It looks so cool. He can control pigs and boars and, and things like, like that. It seems like they were kind of there to help out with their jobs. Yeah. Like that's like part of their equipment. Right. And maybe they were going to use the birds to, you know, I don't know, help spread seeds or do something yeah. like that. Yeah, definitely it wasn't built as like a superpower kind no. of thing. It was like a tool to use basically. But now they are using these helmets to um, try to survive on this, this quickly diminishing planet, um, trying to find food to survive, but also trying to scal uh, salvage parts mm -hmm to build a ship or whatever to get off the planet. Um, there are some wardens who maybe aren't so good and maybe who don't want to leave the planet. Uh, so those are going to be kind of our antagonists. But we don't really meet many. We, we see one at, at one point in the book. But we don't learn a lot about them yet. So more to come on that. We do know there's going to be more wardens. There's a page in this. And just like in that uh, uh, Ghost World book, we see like headshots. Mm -hmm. We see like a, a page full of heads or masks of different ones different wardens that we'll meet. We do not meet them in this book, but you know, it just that just tells me that there's a lot of story coming. But in this book specifically, it just really follows Rook in his day-to-day -day life, scavenging food, scavenging parts, that kind of thing. And kind of how he uses his, how his helmet works and how he interfaces with it, but also how it kind of reflects back onto yeah. him. You yeah. know, this is kind of a two-way street with these birds. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we don't really know what kind of adventure that he's going to get into yet, wh where the story is going to go. This is basically just introducing us to the world and a couple of the characters with lots more to come. Yeah. But I love this. This gave me, this gave me vibes of Mask. You guys know the 80s cartoon Mask where they wore helmets that did special things mixed with Mad Max because yeah. they're on, it, it's kind of sort of post-apocalyptic, although there is wildlife and trees and vegetation, that kind of stuff, but post-apocalyptic in the fact that the resources are very quickly dwindling mm -hmm. and there's vehicles there's like these big vehicles like mad max looking vehicles all around that a lot of people drive Just stuff that they like left behind yeah. when the other people left that now these people who are remaining yeah can take over and like the population seriously dropped because uh, yeah. it tells you the population of one of the cities before and then now and it's like oh like 99 percent of the people yeah. are gone yeah so this for sure. is very like sparse yeah uh, visually, it's great. Jason Faybach's art is mm -hmm. wonderful. The um, creature, I would be so intimidated to be the artist because each of these wardens control animals. There's a lot of animals in mm -hmm. this and it, they're all super cool. It gave me uh, Fallout vibes where it's like, yeah. you don't just have normal animals. They've also, it kind of gives a rough reason why they may have changed, but there's giant versions of things right. or mutated versions of things. So it's not just your regular animals. You're yeah. kind of souk <clears throat> up animals. For sure. Yeah. So it's very, it's very sci-fi. Uh, you know, there's going to be some action gunplay all that kind of stuff um it's a great jumping on point because this is new for all of us mm -hmm. and we're all learning this all about this new world at the same time so this is a great if you're looking for a new book to start reading this is a, a wonderful one. i i just love this i love this so much uh i could talk about it like i could feel this whole show talking yeah. about this book so but i won't do that i will just show you again the a cover right here by jason Faybach. it looks so good and then we have this really cool connecting variant that connects uh, a bunch of the different Ghost Machine properties, whether they are part of the Rook universe or the Unnamed or whatever, just all the different stuff coming out from Ghost Machine on this connecting cover, and this is just part of that. I love this book. It, it was, it was Yeah, very cinematic. It yeah. feels like, oh, we're stepping into something that's going to be very meaty. There's yeah. going to be a lot going on here, a lot of cool characters yeah. that you'll definitely want to be on the forefront yeah. of this. Yeah. Okay, next up, I want to talk about Red Coat number one. So we are getting into the Unnamed Universe here. If you're familiar with books like Geiger, uh, the Unnamed Universe is a shared universe that is pseudo superhero. I would say it's Kinda. it's it's got all the elements of like more um, historical, maybe more sci-fi elements than mm. like superhero elements. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say it's more sci-fi than yeah. superheroes. So we've met Redcoat just briefly 
in the uh, Ghost Machine one shot, and we've seen his name pop up, but never really had a story, like a full story with right. him. So this is by Jeff Johns, and the art is by Brian Hitch. Uh, it, I don't want to give away the the kind of cold opening because it is really cool, but we are introduced to our character Simon Pure in 1776, and he is a redcoat. He is uh, working for the British, but he kind of does explain most of the people, the soldiers. Uh, are kind of just in there for the money. They yeah. don't really have a whole lot of loyalty. They're more just like hired guns for the army. Uh, and that really comes to show when the uh, American army turns and the Redcoats, they're, since they're not super loyal, kind of just hightail it out of there. Yeah. And that is who Simon Pure is. He is uh, not necessarily the greatest guy. He he's doesn't a, have the best loyalty. He's a roguish scoundrel. Scoundrel, but with uh, maybe not even a heart of gold. Yeah, a heart uh, of bronze, a, maybe. A, a weak spine. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's a cool character, but he's definitely not someone you would want to rely on. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, he has encountered uh, the American soldiers in 1778, 1779, something around there. Um, At the very beginning, it's 75. 75, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he encounters them, and as he's he's fleeing, he kind of hides out in an old crypt. Oh, well, that was in 1776 Six. on Christmas Day. On Christmas yeah. Day, yeah. Um, 1775 is the cold open. Right, It's right. very interesting, but yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that. Yeah. Um, More of that, though. I can't yeah. wait to see that. So as he's held up here, uh, he sees down through the rafters there is a kind of a cultist ritual going on. Uh, I don't want to say who the center point of it is, but it's one of the founding fathers of America. <laughs> and it seems like maybe there's some weird stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, but he is kind of a clumsy character, and he falls right into the middle of it. Instead of this person who was in the center getting imbued with some power, it actually goes to Simon, who uh, we've known from a lot of different sources that he becomes immortal. And this is going to be his kind of history in the story of Simon Pure, uh, who never seems to, he doesn't know if it's part of his like curse that he can never be, he always feels hungry. Yeah. Uh, he never seems to be able to like accumulate any wealth or yeah. anything. He's always kind of uh, going from city to city type thing and getting in a lot of trouble. And that may just be his own fault yeah. that he's kind of uh, bad with the women bad with money, all of that. Uh, so it's really cool. We see him through quite a few years. They do tease that like, hey, there's more stories in my past, but uh, we'll talk about those later. So we end up in uh, the 1800s. Yeah, early, I think it's like 100 years later yeah, or something. Where he runs into a young boy who he doesn't realize may end up being one of the world's greatest scientists. Yeah. But all the while, he is being hunted by that cult that originally gave him his power. So this is going to be a really cool mashup of kind of sci-fi, uh, a little Hellboy vibes with like the cults and everything mixed with American history. A lot of history. Like this is really steeped in American history also, but also mystical yeah. magic and things like that. You see a lot of familiar names from uh, U.S. history yeah. here. Uh, any of the founding fathers uh, might make an appearance but it's really cool how that's kind of the backdrop of this kind of roguish scoundrel character making his way through life. And how is it all going to eventually end up in the main Geiger story? We'll have to read it to find out. But another fantastic entry that uh, I think is going to be another one that people will want to check yeah. out uh, as this universe keeps growing. And speaking of which, I also want to throw on there, we have Geiger number one. Now, we've got quite a few Geiger. We've got the miniseries that happened. We've got the two-issue Ground Zero yeah. story. Uh, there's been some little stories here and there. So we're most familiar with Geiger. But this is his first ongoing series by uh, Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. And this is really cool. So uh, I would say it does help if you've read the previous... It, it does give you some, some catch-up. There is a yeah. description. But for the full story, it's great if you read the Geiger like first trade paperback. Mm -hmm. um, but Although it, you might be confused if you read that trade and then and then now there's a new ongoing. You might be a little bit confused with how that because of how the trade ends. But, but we're all kind of learning as yeah. we go. So in this Tarek Geiger, uh, 
who is our glowing man. He's he's definitely a also a very nomadic character. He's going from town to town. He's very peaceful. Um but it's one of those like I kind of uh X-Men mutant type thing. He moves to a city. Oh no, this city's getting attacked. So he has to you know, he wants to do the right thing. He unveils his powers. He's the glowing man. It's very um, 1970s Incredible, Incredible Hulk, Hulk TV show where yeah. he goes town to town. You know, don't make, me, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry, that kind of thing. Yeah, and but of course, when he reveals himself, he's the mythical glowing man. He's Geiger. that guy, yep. Uh, and then the town's like, oh, we don't actually want you here. So he's once again <laughs> right. forced to go on his way. But... He is encountered. He does encounter a character named Nate, the Nuclear Knight, uh, which I feel like is a very Jeff Johns thing. Yeah. This is a very like uh, Silver Age superhero oh, type sure. name, but he's a, a knight that, if you read the first volume, uh, is in association with one of the uh, hotels turned kingdom in Las Vegas. Is very like uh, medieval knights type thing. He's one of those. Uh, but he realized along his journey that Nate wants to actually be a hero. He's not proud of the person he was, and he actually sees uh, Geiger as a hero and wants to follow in his footsteps. But of course, Geiger's very reluctant to do this. But we'll have to see what things go along the way, because it seems like maybe Geiger is being hunted by some mysterious mm -hmm. foe or friend. We'll have to read it and see. But... A great beginning. I'm so glad this is finally an ongoing. Because yeah. now it's like, okay, now we can tell a big story with Geiger. Yeah, because in that miniseries, uh, the you know the original miniseries, they introduced us to a, a a not a big world, but like the, but Las Vegas was big in itself with all these different factions. Yeah, and there was a whole lot of story they could tell with all these even different a whole characters. Map where you could be like, yeah. oh, cool, what's over there? Yeah, and, all that. and we never really got to explore all of it because it was only a six issue miniseries. So now that it's ongoing. Sky's the limit, right? Yeah. And uh, I can't wait to see what they do with all these characters and how they flesh out Geiger, who else he might meet, that kind of thing. Yeah, of course, his dog Barney is yep. there, the uh, two-headed two dog, dog yeah. who's also just very sweet. Uh, so, yeah, you've got three books from the new Ghost Machine imprint. All, all come with our highest recommendation. Yes. Um, I definitely feel like this is a thing, like, maybe you're getting burnout on some of the the usual stuff. We all love Spider-Man. We all love Batman. But, you know, maybe you want to try something, a different flavor, a little bit new, and you want to be in on the ground floor, you know, where you, you're you learning along with everybody else about these characters. Here's three books yeah. that can offer the, a whole new experience. I can't remember a time when something like this happens where a uh, there were three new books. Well, I guess it happens like Marvel and DC do this all the time. But there's three new books... All coming out in the same day. They're all fantastic. Two of them are related to each other, like yeah. in the same universe. Uh, they are like they are coming out of the gate three for three. Yeah. Like fantastic stuff. Yep. And uh, it sounds like these are all going to be monthly. Mm -hmm. uh, the way they they tout it. So and they're all three ninety nine. Uh, but the quality of the book is really good. Yeah. Uh, nice uh, cardstock covers. Uh, nice glossy pages. I think Rook. I think Rook is bigger. I think, it, I think yeah, Rook is a little bit bigger. These are standard size books. Uh, Rook is a little bit thicker, but all of them four bucks, and yeah. you get a lot of good stuff for that four bucks. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to try investing in a new uh, whole universe, try out these three books. Yeah, all of them. Yep, all of them are great. Yep. Well, <clears throat> we are. We I'm just gonna show the variants. Yeah, variants. Uh, much like the other one, we have here's the one for red coat. That's a connecting variant, yeah. Connecting variant, and then we have the one. I don't know which way they go. I think maybe Rook goes in the center or something. But uh, they have these. Wait, I think connecting uh, Rook. Covers. I think Rook does this. Is that right? Do we have that right? Something like that. Uh, yeah, something like that. Very cool. So if you want to get all the variants too, they're all connecting, which is super yeah. cool. There are also, each book has a blank sketch variant, but I'm not sure if maybe we got some and already put them in pull yeah, boxes or what, sure. but these are the ones we have for, you know, for order right mm. now. <clears throat> but there are some cool Marvel and DC books uh, and some other uh, publishers out today too. So we wanted to also tell you about Deadpool number one. Uh, this is a new number one. I think this is supposed to be ongoing. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure. But a brand new Deadpool series. This is written by Cody Ziegler. The art is by Roge Antonio. 
Um, this is the first appearance of a new villain named Death Grip. I want to go ahead and put that out there because it's a very interesting villain. Um, you know, I've never really been the biggest fan of Deadpool in the comics because it's usually a lot of chatter and all, a whole bunch of silliness and a whole bunch of stuff to read that contributes nothing to the story. And it's just, it kind of feels like a, a, a tough read sometimes. I'll say I loved this. I thought this new one was really, really good. It's exactly the right level of action and antics and that kind and of thing. There is some uh, humanity and uh -huh. a little bit deeper feelings yeah. to Deadpool in this one. There's some there's some kind of touching moments in this that almost remind me more of the movie where yeah. there's some there's some heaviness. Or maybe he's kind of masking some of his yeah. deeper feelings. Yeah, I feel like Deadpool in this maybe is dialed back one to two notches, yeah. which is where I want Deadpool to be. Um, <clears throat> so in this one, most of the issue is Deadpool chasing down this guy that he's been uh, hired to kill. Uh, we don't know if he's like a, a tech guy or maybe he is a, um, a mad scientist. Deadpool didn't read the file, so he doesn't <laughs> really know why he's supposed to kill this guy. He just knows that he's supposed to. Um, now, Deadpool also has a symbiote dog? Daughter. Da well, no, the dog. But the dog's also his daughter. Is it really? Yeah, he calls it his daughter. But I thought it was like how a dog owner would call them. Like, uh, the yeah, but I think it's also because it, it came from a hole in his chest. Right, okay. Well, <laughs> so right there, I didn't read the last series, yeah. so this that was a little bit weird for me. I was like, who is, why does he have this giant? pretty yeah. fast. Yeah, but it's the two of them, you know, mowing through this guy's security, doing all the Deadpool things you would expect, and then chasing the main guy through the city trying to get at him. Um, he find, When he finally does catch up to the main guy he's supposed to kill, he's a little bit too late because he finds that there is this villain named Death Grip who already got to him. And we see that this character, Death Grip, is actually a pretty powerful magic user, which is pretty interesting to see Deadpool go up against somebody like that. Um, they fight for a bit before Death Grip escapes, but, or I guess sort of just retreats or whatever, but uh, Death Grip is actually very happy that he met Deadpool because he says that Deadpool is unencumbered by death, mm -hmm. and he says that there's many lessons he can learn from Deadpool. And I think that's what the uh, what this first story arc is going to be about is what are Death Grip's plans for Deadpool? That's kind of hard to say, Death Grip and Deadpool. <laughs> but what are Death Grip's plans for Deadpool? What does he want Deadpool for? What does he want to do with him? That kind of thing. And um, I, I just, I dug it. The art was fantastic. The action was good. There wasn't a whole, whole lot of wacky Deadpool silliness, that kind of yeah. thing. Like it was the right level of everything. Plus there's kind of a post credit scene a little bit after the last page that shows you the cover of the next issue, you turn it, and there's like two or three pages, and that's where a lot of that humanity comes in. I won't tell you what it's about, but it was very interesting to see Deadpool in that situation. So I liked it. I really, really yeah, liked I this a lot. He says uh, he's got a symbiote, symbiote dog daughter named Princess. Okay. But that's not his other daughter. That's not his other daughter. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you are a Deadpool fan, or if you're thinking about dabbling in Deadpool like me, and you want to find a good book to read, I highly recommend this one. I, I thought like it was this great. one, like you said, uh, I've read quite a bit of Deadpool, just various series back, you know, Cable Deadpool, uh, his original series, mm -hmm. like the the Way Run, all of that, and it is the I think some of the issues that you run into Deadpool is he can be so jokey, it's like. The writers just want to write everything yeah, and yeah. like everything is an idea that he says there's no like pruning it back right. he's just gonna say everything and sometimes it takes a really long time to get through a deadpool book because you're like right you turn the page and it's just dialogue yeah nothing but that and it's I, silly dialogue that means nothing to yeah, the story i feel like this one is you know instead of being like let's tell every joke let's pick up the best jokes yeah. and tell those yeah. and actually let a lot of the action you know have a lot of uh, art jokes too of like yeah. the way he's fighting or things he's you know it's it's a little bit like less full sentencey more punchy dialogue yeah, yeah. maybe like Spider Man quipping but just a little extra yeah uh, and but it was great I really really liked this a lot so uh, there is our A cover right there and we have a bunch of variants for this too of course so we have the uh, Garon uh, vampire variant there's a lot more of these uh, coming up. We have the Rob Liefeld variant. I think Rob Liefeld's drawn Deadpool once or twice before. Uh, we have this really nice um, Inhyuk Lee foil variant, which looks really, really good. I like that one a lot. 
We have this uh, Mercado variant with Deadpool with a big old gun. He does not use a gun that this size. That feels very uh, 90s. <laughs> That's very really 90s. Like right? He's got the sword strapped to it, too. That's neat. Um, I like this one a lot. This is the uh, Jan Basil Dua Stormbreakers variant. Poor poor teddy bear. There is a, 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 a Pete Woods Micronauts variant, which is really cool. There is the Saturday morning variant. We've seen a lot of these over the last few weeks. And then we have the 1 in 25 Stegman variant that we're selling for $30. The Deadpool with a sword in his head. He'll be fine. I'm really excited. Uh, the cover of the next issue has him teamed up with Taskmaster. Taskmaster I know. And I'm like that's a that's a great team. I love Taskmaster, and with as much as I like this, like I think that's gonna be awesome. I yeah. can't wait for that. Okay, so my next one, another indie book, but of course it is Avoid Rivals, issue number eight, and this is a big story they're telling now. This kind of like a uh, uh, second volume of Avoid Rivals. So we see uh, more about Salila's past in this, which turns out she maybe didn't have the greatest upbringing. It seems like a very yeah. like conflict-focused um, race that she's from. Uh, but we also know in the last issue, they sent the new character Proximus out to hunt them. Uh, so they are trying to cross this great divide that... We still don't quite know how they're going to survive. They, it says they only pretty much could survive for half of that uh, right. way across it from the, the void that they're on. But they're being hunted by Proximus. And most of this is like big fighting with Proximus definitely like very big, powerful. He also runs a motorcycle. Yeah. Which I thought was That's like cool. for a very futuristic, you know, it's not a hover bike. It looks like just a straight up like motorcycle dirt bike thing yeah. that he rides out which was really really cool but oh uh, who is proximus and does he have any ties to our lead characters you're going to read it to find out but a uh, very intriguing issue of void rivals mm -hmm. and a shocking final page that uh could be you know could be solved in a panel one panel in the next one could be devastating for the series. Right. <laughs> so uh, don't miss out on that. A great, great issue of Void Rivals continues to be the, I don't want to say it's the unsung hero of the Inner John universe, but it's, you know, maybe it doesn't get quite the the focus that Transformers or G.I. Joe does, but still continues to bring fantastic stories. Yeah, we've said it before. Don't sleep on Void Rivals, you know, just because that's a new property in the Inner John universe. It's telling a really cool story. And we know the, uh, the next issue. The next it? issue is going to have another Transformers connection as well. That's not a spoiler. That's on the main A cover <laughs> yeah, it's, of the next it's issue. Right there in your face. There's a big old Transformer on it. Yep. Yeah. So great issue of Void Rivals. We also have some variants as well. So we've got this is the open order variant, and then we've got a couple of incentives. We've got the uh, Arahuo and Holoron variant that we're selling for eight dollars. And we have the uh, Calida variant. This is a 1 in 25. We're selling for $15. Well, next up is Spider-Man Shadow of the Green Goblin, number one. This is a new mini-series. And this, <clears throat> this is written by J.M. DiMatteis of, of Spider-Man fame. Uh, and the article is by Michael uh, Stav Maria. And this takes place less than a month after... Uncle Ben's death. So Peter Parker wow, is still it's young. Fresh. It's fresh. Yeah, he's still young. He's still in high school. Um, Norman and Harry Osborn and Gwen Stacy are also in this, but he uh, Peter doesn't know them yet because he didn't meet them until college. So they're in it, and we see you know how they um, uh, how they feed into the story. But Peter, you know, they don't they don't meet. You know, they're not like rewriting history or whatever. Um, this is centered around Norman Osborn's research assistant. It's a guy named Nels Van Adder. He is the one who took the very first Goblin Serum before it was um, uh, before it was perfected, and you know then Norman took it and became the Green Goblin. So in this one, uh, Nels Van Adder, you know, he becomes this go this monstrous Goblin character um, called the Proto Goblin, and it's not like you know where Norman took it and he still looked normal just with a costume. This guy actually becomes big and monstrous and red, um, and he's trying to basically find Looks a like cure. What happened to Ultimate Green Goblin in the yeah, original kind of, universe? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, he became more monster than a suit. 
Yeah. Now, uh, this story of the Proto Goblin was actually told in uh, Spider Man Minus One back in 1997. They did a series of Minus One books. All the Spider Man and Hulk and Thor and all those guys, they all got these Minus One issues. So, this isn't the first time we've seen the Proto Goblin. They, told, they have told this story before. But it's going to get a little bit... Fle that was just one issue. Uh, it's going to get a little bit more fleshed out in this. Um, now, the Proto-Goblin in this has been instructed to go after Harry. Uh, and we find out who uh, who that someone is and why they want him to go after ha uh, Harry. We find that out at the end of the issue, but I won't tell you what it is. Um, you know, Spider-Man comes in to stop him. Uh, and there's also a couple of other subplots running through this. Uh, we see Peter and Aunt May still grieving over the loss of Ben. And, you know, Peter comes home and he's kind of bruised up and tells Aunt May not to worry about it. She gets mad. She's like, we just lost your uncle and now you're coming home bruised up, you know, and you're telling me not to, you know, how, you know. So they're still very, very um, hurt. And then Gwen is worried about her mom being sick. Gwen and Harry are together in this. So there's that whole thing as well. It's interesting how there's this whole book with characters that we know to be friends yeah. and close but we know they can't meet yet so they're yeah. running very parallel yeah. paths yeah yeah you've got uh harry and gwen over here and peter over here and they don't really cross paths well i mean they kind of do but kind of don't but i won't i won't talk about it but uh yeah just a really cool story of spider-man in his earliest days dealing with a goblin that came before this goblin so yeah if you're a spider-man fan definitely check this out uh, so we have this A cover right here, and then we got a couple cool variants. We have this really yeah, nice, some really nice, yeah, variant. the Paul Smith Green Goblin variant, which is really cool. And you know, this, like I said, this takes place before Norman Osborn became the Green Goblin, so I don't know if we'll catch up to that at some point. This is creepy. This is a Mike Del Mundo variant of Green Goblin coming out of uh, Norman's brain. Brain looks, looks like a bunch of gross shrimp. Oh, it's a bunch of pumpkins. Oh, I don't think it was brain. Yeah, it's a bunch of pumpkin bombs. If you can see that. Um, and then we have this really cool um, Dan Panosian. Is that a vampire variant? Um, you know, I, I don't, just a, I don't yeah, just a nice retro looking variant. And then there's this one in twenty five Malieve variant that we're selling for thirty dollars. Yeah, that's really cool. I like how it, it's not even Spider Man Year One. It's like Spider Man like Week Two or week something. Two. <laughs> Yeah, now all the books have to do their character week two. Yeah. Thor week two, where he's <laughs> still bumming around as Donald Blake. Okay, so next up, I've got Star Wars issue number 45. Uh, this I really like this storyline. This is the trial of Lando, because, of course, we see in Empire Strikes Back, where Lando sells out uh, Luke and the Rebellion and everyone to Vader, in order to, yes, protect Cloud City and his people, but it was a very, you know, not great thing that he did, to in Return of the Jedi, where he's, like, being made, like, a captain or general, and it seems like, what happened in between there? How did they, they change that? Well, that is what this story is. So, the trial of Lando, uh, we saw in the last one that as his trial is beginning, uh, one of the, the judges, it's a very, like, private Thing. There's three judges. One of them is Mon Mothma, who her hologram, she's kind of on another planet. She gets attacked and basically held for ransom. And so that's going on while they're trying to do the trial of Lando. And it's there's some parallels. You know, they think maybe, not that he had something to do with it, but this is kind of just the fallout from what he did. But it's very interesting because half of this issue is him being on trial and them calling witnesses. Leia is a witness. Mm. They invest. They talk to Leia about what was your first meeting with uh, Lando. That's why you've got this cover. This doesn't actually happen. There's not a stormtrooper in this. Boba Fett's not in this, except in the flashback. And you see back to Empire Strikes Back where Leia talks about, like, you know, I kind of thought he was a creep when I first mm. met him and everything. And, uh, you know, she's really not on his side. But it's a very interesting kind of, like, what does each of the characters think about him at this point? But on the other hand, we have them going after Mon Mothma, trying to retrieve her, and that is done by Kez Dameron, who is Poe Dameron's father. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and he's kind of investigating the crime scene, only to discover that there is a uh, hollow recording of Mon Mothma 
that uh, I won't reveal what it says. But Lando, on the other hand, seeks help from Chewbacca, who he thinks might he might have a way of getting out of this. But of course, Chewbacca is not too happy with Lando at this point because he froze Han and Carbonite. He was the reason for that. It was his carbon freezing chamber. So uh, Chewbacca is not too sure he wants to help Lando mm -hmm. out. But you're kind of seeing Lando in this go from being this like schmarmy, like, you know, very flashy guy to like, maybe I'm becoming like a rebel in this. And maybe I do believe in what they're standing for. So really great issue of Star Wars issue number 45. I'm still really wondering... Uh, if this series is going to maybe end at 50 and start with a new number one, we'll have to... I don't, we haven't got that far yet in yeah. the solicitations, but it feels like they're getting very, very close to Return of the Jedi time frame. So that is our A cover, which I really like. We also have this Cumin Coley variant. This is the Master and Apprentice variant with a Luke and Ray. I really like this one. I ordered that one. And we've got this uh, Rebels 10th Anniversary cover with Thrawn. And lastly, we have a 1 in 25 Woo variant they're selling for $20. Well, <clears throat> next is Vengeance of the Moon Knight number 4. And I can't talk a lot about this one because I don't want to spoil anything. Because in this issue, we find out who the new Moon Knight is. We finally learn uh, the identity. Um, but I will tell you that Hunter's Moon and Tigra, they have tracked him down to his, you know, where he's hold up basically and they launch a full frontal assault on just the two of them they just like front attack him <laughs> uh, but they do it during the day in the hopes that he'll be a little bit weaker which is pretty cool and then you know it, it just like the other issues of this series have been it kind of goes back and forth between hunter's moon or you know in the other issues it's been a different character but every issue has is featured a different character talking to the um the psychiatrist whose name i just forgot um but um you know back and forth between them talking with her and then you know some action and that's what happens in this hunter's moon and tiger attacking uh the new moon knight versus uh hunter's moon talking to the psychiatrist back and forth back and forth but um in 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 his talk in hunter's moon talking with the psychiatrist he tells her how he figured out who the new moon knight is um, and then they confront the new Moon Knight, and they have already figured it out. And then during the fight, the mask comes off, and we see who it is. And uh, yeah, I won't say anything else about that. But uh, a very important issue in this series because yeah, because we find out who it is. And then the next one, I think, is a Blood Hunt tie-in. I think it's the next one. So maybe maybe we won't see much more of that for a couple issues or so while Blood Hunt's going on, and then they'll they'll address it after that. I'm not really hold sure. Hold that thought. Yeah, hold that thought. We, we gotta, gotta go. go. <laughs> yeah, we gotta go fight some vampires real quick. But uh, yeah, we definitely definitely find out who it is in this issue, and uh, I'm glad that it didn't drag out too much longer than yeah. this. But this is our A cover right here, and then we got a couple variants as well. We've got another one of these nice uh, vampire variants by uh, Torque. And then there is this uh, Sharf variant with the new Moon Knight. And then there is a 1 in 25 uh, Lozano variant that we're selling for $20. Next up for me, we've got X-Men number 33. Now, I know we are getting close to the end of yep. all these X-Men <laughs> books and the fall of Krakoa. So almost every issue of any of these books going forward, big stuff happens in. And that is no different for this one. Now, this is interesting because this actually begins with Sebastian Shaw and his son. And Sebastian Shaw basically says, like, I have my ways of if the X-Men win, the Mutantum wins, uh, I can come out on top. But if um, Orcus wins, I have my ways of coming out on top, too. But he goes, but there's one thing. If things come up asymmetrical or uh, if things go a little odd, I want to have, like, a contingency plan. I want to have... He, he's got safe houses everywhere, but in particular, he has one in Madripoor. Mm. But that one has been taken over by uh, mutants in hiding. And so he sends his son and the Reavers to clear it out. And this hideout has mutants like Callisto in it. Okay. So some, some mutants that you know. But it seems like... Maybe he didn't tell his son the whole truth, and maybe that there's something else in his hideout 
that uh, he wants to protect from these mutants. I won't give it away, but it's a pretty big part of the entire Orca story that uh, for some part gets wrapped up in this. We'll say someone is there and is uh, we see that full story end up. Uh, but it's really cool. And, of course, the Reavers show up and... Uh, I believe Emma Frost knows that, hey, something's going down. I need the X-Men. But maybe the X-Men aren't enough, so they might need the help of the X-Men of Doom. Remember where Dr. Doom yeah. had his own X-Men team? So pretty cool issue here. Uh, and just getting ever closer to the end, like pieces are getting knocked off the table in this. And I'll say there's some pretty major turning points in this issue of X-Men. So that is X-Men number 33. We've got some great variants. So we've got the Hildebrandt variant with Emma Frost. And we have this uh, Lee Garbett vampire variant. I like that one. Yeah, very cool. <clears throat> All right, so next up I've got Immortal Thor number nine. And we've been sort of keeping an eye on this one as we get inch ever closer to the Roxxon presents Thor, where he's a big buffoon, and um, that all of that stuff makes a little bit more sense with this one, and I'm, I'm glad. So in this one, Thor confronts uh, Dario Agar, who is the Minotaur. He confronts him in his office at Roxxon about the damage that his corporation is doing to the planet. Um, the Minotaur shows Thor an illusion of what the Earth will look like when he's done with it, and it's a desolate wasteland with a big Roxxon dome. Uh, and inside that dome is a, is a picture-perfect life. A picture, you know, uh, houses and grass and sky and water and all that kind of stuff. And th he says, this is what I my plans for the Earth are. We're going to wipe it out except for a dome that I control, basically. And then, of course, it devolves into, you know, Thor gets into a fight with the Executioner, um, who is also there with the Minotaur. Uh, but he starts to feel a little bit sluggish during the fight, like... Uh, Maybe his head's clouded a little bit. He just doesn't feel like himself. And it's revealed that uh, the Minotaur and the Executioner, Scourge the Executioner, and also the Enchantress who's been working with them, that's when they revealed, reveal to him that they have made a comic book about him uh, that portrays him as a big buffoon. And that millions of people reading it combined with some magic. So, and you said this before, you said, I feel like there's going to be some magic yeah. there. So there is, it's not just that, oh, we made a comic and now it is affecting Thor. Like there's magic involved in this. Um, but it's, it's basically a, a, a million of people, millions of people are going to read this comic book and they're going to like, oh, Thor's a big goofy goofball. It, combine that with some magic. And that is making Thor much weaker. Uh, and in two weeks from now, we're actually going to get to read that comic that they show him. It's cool because there's a couple of panels where he's reading that Roxxon presents Thor, and it's got the cover that the cover that we're going to get, and he's sitting there reading it. Um, so that's where the meta, the slight fourth wall break and stuff comes in. But the next issue that we're going to get, uh, it's not an issue of Immortal Thor. It's going to be that Roxxon presents Thor, where he's a big, uh, a big oaf. Uh, and he's got a Thor truck, and he's all corporate out with a rocks on hammer and a big T on his chest. Um, and that comic is affecting him because of the magic that Enchantress has put around it. So there is an element of magic which helps it makes more make more sense to me. You yeah. know, like oh, it's it's a magic thing. That's all you have to worry about. It's a magic thing. But uh, I've been really excited for that for that story. I want to really see that comic, and this is the lead into that. So I'm really uh, excited to see it. I really like this idea. I know it's very like out there yeah but there's something about it that also just feels like a like a classic comic book yeah. story where they would do something like this yeah and the minotaur even mentions you know to thor oh you thought it would be okay to let the earthlings make stories about your adventures and you thought the proceeds could go to charity and stuff well i'm going to show you why you shouldn't have done that because now we have our own comic and it's going to affect you and all kinds of stuff so really really fun and interesting really interesting story so there's our A cover right there of Enchantress ripping up Thor's first appearance. That's fine. It doesn't. It's not really worth anything. <laughs> um, we have this um, Davila cover, which I really like. I love the just the old school look of it. Yeah. And then we have this um, Darbo cover with the Enchantress. And then this is our Nick Bradshaw connecting variant. This is going to connect with the Rocks on Thor comic that's coming out in a couple of weeks. The other half being the Goofy looking Thor and Minotaur and all those guys. It's going to connect with that. 
It's a magic thing. Don't worry it's about it. It's a magic it. thing. It's a magic it's thing. It's like the, it's uh, unstable molecules. Yeah. You, you just throw a little bit of there and you brush over any of the weirdness. Yep. Okay, next up, I've got a new number one. This is Red Sonia Empire of the Dam number one. So uh, I was excited to read this. It's by Steve Niles. And the art is by, let me get back to my notes, Alessandro Amorso. And in this, uh, it's it's really cool because this is just, we've got the regular ongoing Red Sonia. This is a standalone mini series. Uh, Sonia is, I feel like she's one of those people who like finds peace in chaos, like, you know, in the battle and everything. She's at a bar uh, and there's just crazy stuff going on at the bar. There's fights going on, on there's people making out. There's just, this huh. is just her kind of chaos. And she's just having a drink. Uh, she notices another guy from across the bar who wants to buy her a drink and the, the like guy delivers it to her, the, the barkeep. And she's like, Oh, this guy bought you this drink. She's like, and just like turns out yeah. and gives <laughs> an evil look. Um, but it all goes bad when some local guards burst in and say, we're breaking this up. We're shutting this down, all of this. And of course, Sonia doesn't want to comply and neither does this guy who tried to buy her a drink and they end up in the same prison together. Now, uh, they get to talking in this prison, and this guy tells her the story about this uh, this forgotten city that's hidden. There's this battlefield that is just covered in the remains of soldiers because this warlock made them fight until they were all dead. Uh, and this warlock went from town to town and gathered treasure, and he knows he's got a map to where that treasure is. And if Sonia will help him break out of jail, they can go on this adventure together and split the rewards. And so, of course, Sonia's like, that sounds pretty good to me, and I can get out of these situations. But uh, there's some twists and turns to the end of it that maybe the everything is not quite as straightforward. Uh, even, like, what is this map that he's referring to? Is it actually a map map, or is it something else? Hmm. Uh, very, very cool uh, story that uh, I like that they do these. I, I would like for there kind of always to be like a Red Sonja miniseries going on. Yeah. It's very Conan-like. Yeah, very, oh like, yeah. Adventure of the Day. It doesn't <laughs> matter what time frame this takes yeah. place in in her history. It doesn't matter which story you read when. Yeah. They're just They're just adventures. Yeah, just an adventure story, and I think this is a great one, especially if you're like, well, I'm too far behind on the regular Red Sonja to pick it up. Here's a, a new one that you can jump right into and have a fun adventure. And of course, this is a dynamite book, so you know we've got a bunch of variant covers. First off, we have this John Tyler Christopher negative space variant. We've got this Joshua Middleton foil yeah, variant of the A cover. We've got this one in seven tan variant that we're selling for eight dollars. I love I love dynamite's one in seven one in ratios. Seven. You oh know? yeah, there's. There's multiple uh, weird <laughs> numbers they've got. This is the 1 in 10 Lisner foil variant that we're selling for $10. And lastly, we have a foil version. This is a 1 in 10 uh, John Tyler Christopher foil variant of that one that we're selling for $15. Well, next up is Avengers number 12. And this was an action-packed issue because the Avengers <coughs> launched... An all-out assault on Orcus. It is time for the Avengers to finally get involved with all of the stuff that the X-Men are dealing with with Orcus. Tony has been holding the Avengers at bay for a little while, saying, "You know, I'm, I'm, let me put the pieces in place." And this, in this issue, he says, "Go, yeah. it's time." And so um, they they sort of take a two-pronged attack. They have, and it's funny because at one point uh, they call them the Mighty Avengers. And that's the that's uh, Iron Man and Thor and Vision and Captain Marvel and they're just like uh, you know head first you know they're attacking all these different Orcus strongholds as quickly as they can before Orcus realizes what's going on and can launch a counterattack. But then you have the Secret Avengers, which is Black Panther, Captain America, and Scarlet Witch. Using all the names. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, they um. They're the ones that uh, kind of infiltrate the bases, and their main goal is to rescue the captured mutants from these various Orcus bases. So while the you know the the big powerhouses are out here just like laser blast and stuff, you've got these other guys in here doing some secret stuff. Um, what's interesting about this is they attack several different Orcus bases. One of the bases they attack is Orcus's base in Alaska, 
which the X-Men are going to use as their base in the upcoming X-Men book by Jed McKay and Ryan Stegman. Very cool. So that that's one of our earliest little bits of yeah. the new stuff. Yeah, so that that book, uh, you know, that group of X Men in that book is going to be uh, headquartered in Alaska, and it's going to be in the Orcus base that they attack in this issue. Um, uh, what else? Oh, there's there's a surprise character, or at least it was a surprise to me. I'll have to ask you afterwards if they're in any other book. But there's a surprise character who is working for Orcus, who knows how the Avengers operate, and is able to make. Uh, uh, counter-offensive plans against them, and we see what those counter-offensive plans are at the end of the issue, and I, it's going to be a big uh, slam-bang issue next issue, too, to see what happens. But, yeah, just a, a, a very, very action-packed issue because they are just zooming across to all these different bases, all these different fights. It's really, really cool. So we have this A cover right here. There are some uh, other variants, but I think maybe we've already filled pull boxes. Yeah. Because this is the only one we have left to uh, to sell to show you. I like all of this, like they're all these final assaults on Orcus yeah. through all the different books. You know, yeah. you finally have everyone. You know, it's no more sneaking around. It's yeah. like okay, we're all we're all f full steam ahead yeah. at Orcus. Yeah, there's definitely no. I mean, they are just like head head first, just blowing up bases. I'll be interested to see like Phalong and stuff like how yeah. that's all going to wrap up mm -hmm. and which book is that going to wrap up in. And... Yeah, because I want to see like what this looks like if there's any kind of reference to this in the, whatever the next issue of Iron Man is. Yeah, yeah that's going to be cool. They've so, done a great job with all bringing all this together sure. in one big of, story. It, there's a lot of discussion between the writers about yeah. this. Okay, next up I want to talk about this. This is really cool. This is Hack Slash Kill Your Idols. This is a one shot you know, I'm a fan of Hack Slash and Tim Seeley. Uh, and this was originally released as, as little short chapters in that Image Plus uh, book that they did throughout the year uh, a year or two ago, I want to say. Was it last year? I think so. Um, it was released in little chapters, but this, it is all collected together. So this is by Tim Seeley, uh, the artist by uh, Stefano Caselli and Dan Leister. And in this, uh, Cassie and Vlad, our, our main characters in here, our slasher hunters, uh, are on a routine case. You're very like, oh, it's a slasher at a beach. Uh, who's called um, the Pocket Beach Penetrator. <laughs> the <laughs> name of the slasher. They're like, man, they just need to, I think uh, Cassie says, they need to start naming them like Hurricanes. Just like yeah. Hurricane Debbie or something like that. <laughs> slasher Debbie. Uh, but... What's weird about this one is, one, they thought they kind of had cleaned up most of the slashers uh, that were immortals and everything, but it turns out this was a, a new one. And as they're trying to take him out, he starts saying a name. And when they do a little bit of research into that name, it actually takes them to the image character Super Patriot. So there's kind of like, kind of a thread that goes from one thing to another, and turns out this is going to be a big crossover between hack slash and kind of your classic 90s image universe so we're gonna get characters like uh super patriot blood strike shadow hawk and more so if you're a fan of that classic image stuff this is great because you get them all in here interacting with each other i love super patriot from savage dragon yeah. and super freaks and uh robert kirkman wrote a mini series with him so it's great to see all those characters back and interacting with very different characters, which is Cassie and Vlad. So uh, there, if you haven't read any Hack Slash, I still think this would be a fun uh, addition. You kind of get into it pretty fast. They're they're very simplistic storylines, but with this one, you get all of your classic uh, characters. So that is our A cover. There is a variant, but I think we also have done all the polls for it. But it's just really cool to see, like, look, Shadowhawk in there. Yeah. Just characters that don't get a whole lot of spotlight right. nowadays. Well, so my last one is Batman number 146. This is the second part of the Dark Prisons storyline, which is part of the larger Zer and Aw storyline they've been telling, which ultimately will feed into the Absolute Power crossover that's coming out later this year. Um, this one's really interesting, though, because in this we learn just how far back... This, this whole big story, like Chip Zdarsky's run this whole time has dealt with Failsafe and Zurian Awe and Joker and Penguin and Dr. Capcio. And we learned how far back all of that really goes. So we get, um, it becomes it becomes a lot bigger and a lot more interconnected uh, with what we see and hear. 
Um, Batman also attempts an escape from Blackgate, which is where Failsafe has him locked up. And uh, Failsafe and Robin, Failsafe is uh, saying that he's Batman, uh, you know, uh, Batman's consciousness. That He says that Batman died and his consciousness upload. So And Robin believes him. So Failsafe and Robin, uh, they continue to go around Gotham, apprehending more and more criminals. But their methods uh, by doing that, uh, or their methods of doing that are becoming more and more extreme. To where Robin may start be, may, he's, he's starting to question like, wait a minute, this just feels off, that mm. kind of thing. Uh, Oracle or uh, Batgirl or Babs, Barbara, whoever, whatever, you know, uh, and Nightwing, um, they're really questioning what's going on. And they maybe reach out to uh, outside the Bat family for a little bit of guidance on all this as well. So it's just a really cool, I'm really enjoying it. I really want to see where it goes. Uh, it's a great next part to this giant uh, Batman story that Chips and Darcy has been telling. So this is our A cover right here. And then we have a couple variants. This really cool Jim Lee uh, artist spotlight variant, which um, that's Gotham by Gaslight, right? I so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, that's Batman on a horse is always cool. And then there's this really nice 1 in 25 Dan Panosian variant that we're selling for $25. That one's really cool. Yeah. And my last two, just want to go over really fast. We've got... Birds of Prey, number eight. This has been a really fun story arc as uh, I like that we're kind of getting a rotating team. So we have Vixen, a member now. And in this one, we have what happened in the last one continuing where the Birds of Prey have snuck into this uh, fashion show, like an underwear lingerie fashion show. Uh, I'm interested. Which turns out to be a big old trap for them. And action ensues. Hilarity ensues as Barda... Uh, goes full in the buff attacking people. <laughs> very, very funny. Uh, but I just, I don't know. I really like there's a rotating cast. We've brought um, Barbara Gordon into this, and she's kind of playing the Oracle role again mm -hmm. for them. But where we're going next also looks super, super cool. The art is great in this. It's very original for kind of a mainstream book. Uh, I believe uh, Pina is the artist, yeah, on it. So uh, definitely check this out. I thought it was really, really fun. We got some variants for that one. I love this. Yeah, so we've got this really nice Derek Chu variant. I love Black Canary. We've got another Jim Lee spotlight with Barda. Not in the buff. Not in the buff, but still pretty buff. Yeah, buff, yeah. We also have this Michael Jannon variant. And we have... This 1 in 25 Educur variant we're selling for $25. Harley is not on the team currently, so uh, but she still manages to make it on the cover. Yeah. And then lastly, I've got She-Hulk. This is She-Hulk number 7. We're still doing our kind of She-Hulk and Jack of Hearts on vacation. But uh, Jack of Hearts runs into a uh, old friend slash lover, Ganymede, who is from some... Old Marvel books, it even like gives you one of those little like, hey, didn't we tell you to like dig in the back issues yeah. and read some uh, some of these issues? And how does that affect She Hulk's relationship with Ganymede when Ganymede says, "Oh, I'm finally uh, ready to take you up on your offer." Jack of Hartree said, "You would be with me forever," or something like that. So I'm gonna go fight She Hulk now. Uh, so very very cool in there. Uh, continues to be a really fun series. And we've got a 1 in 25 David Nakayama cover for this that we are selling for $40. Really nice. And we did want to show you just real quick. I forgot about this. Yeah. We have the um, Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong final printings, issues one through four. And they make this really cool. Uh, let's see if I'm, I don't want to do this backwards. Um, well, they're, they're connecting covers. Like if you hold, like, I think issue three and four. Like that, or do we have this backwards? Yeah, we'll we'll put them on the stands here. I think this is right. And let's see, one needs to go over here. Is that right? Yep. Yep. So it's a really cool connecting variant uh, for these. These are the final printings. There is a collected edition coming out after this is all over. But these are the you know they and it was cool. I've never seen them called final printing before. Yeah. But final printings of one, two, three, and four. And if you get these covers, they make this really cool. Connecting variant. So we just wanted to show that off because it's neat. Yeah, it's neat. Get them all, put them up on your wall and have a nice little uh, panorama yeah. scene. 
But that is it for our show. So thank you so much for watching. Remember to head over to infinityflux.net right now where you can buy these books we just talked about while supplies last. Plus there's plenty of other things that came out this week we didn't go over that is over there at infinityflux.net. Remember to like and subscribe. That means so much to us as we... Cl we close in on 3,000 subscribers. Yeah, that'd be great. That was one of our biggest goals when we started this, and we're finally getting there. So, so excited about that. If you're a fan of these early comic looks, of our uh, FOC shows where we show you stuff that you can order up on, we've got a lot of things planned for the future as well. So go ahead and subscribe to be uh, aware of all of yeah. that good stuff. And leave us an emoji of... A bird for Rook. A, a you bird know. for Rook. Yeah. Because it's soon to be your favorite book. It's, yep. Yeah, sure. uh, so thank you so much for watching. And until next time, see ya. See ya.